Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. We'll look here in verse uh, 8 and 9. It says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now notice something here. Jesus got anointed with the oil of gladness. But Jesus got anointed with the oil of gladness for a reason. What was that reason? It's twofold. Number one, he loved righteousness. Number two, he hated iniquity. He loved righteousness, but he hated iniquity. <clears throat> now, the Greek word loved here is uh, agapo. Agape, you know, like agape, but agapo, it's, it's, a, it's a cognate of the, of the verb. Uh, so it's, it's, it is a, a form of the same word, uh, depending on the voice, the tense, and the, uh, uh, you know, all that stuff. You know, you get, the, you get the, the tense, you get the voice, you get the, um, all those ARTs and past tense, present tense, all that stuff you get involved. And it, it gets a little bit different spelling, okay? Just like we do in English. Love, loved, loving, okay? All right, so here, here we, get, we get it. Just, but it's, it is that root word of agape. Or agapo, and it, it meaning, you know, love, unconditional love, or the love that God has. Amen. So he, he loved righteousness. He loved righteousness. Everybody say, Jesus loved righteousness. Notice that the scepter of his kingdom was righteousness. Amen. But on, right following that, and hated. Now, the word hated here, the, uh, it has three main meanings. One is to hate somebody. I hate you. I despise your guts. All right? To hate someone or something. Um, another meaning is to prefer above. Like God loved Jacob but hated Esau. He did not hate Esau's guts. He preferred Jacob above him. To prefer above. Okay? So the word can mean to prefer as in Jacob and Esau. God didn't hate Esau. He preferred Jacob above him. So the word hated was used there, but the meaning there being he preferred Jacob. All right? <clears throat> but thirdly is the, uh, the meaning of the word, and it means to abhor, which is what it means here. He abhors iniquity. Now, I recently heard somebody trying to explain the word iniquity, meaning having a bent disposition towards, and, and, and I went and looked it up. I couldn't find it. As a matter of fact, uh, the word iniquity is the strongest word used in the Bible in reference to sin. Okay? It literally means lawlessness. Not just you did something wrong, it's lawlessness. Okay, so let's, let's get into this here, because if we want the oil of joy, how many want to have the oil of joy? Now, we got people running around, you know, they, they got all kinds of statements they make. Woo, I'm under grace, I can do anything I want to do. Then you, don't, then you don't hate iniquity. As a matter of fact, you don't even love righteousness. Jesus' scepter is the scepter of righteousness. Okay, so let's look in here. There are four Greek words that were used in the Bible in reference to sin. Okay. Um, but let's look at this. Well, I will we'll get there. Um, I'm trying to find where I want to start with this, okay, because I want to I cover all these things. Hallelujah. Um, the word hamarita, hamartia, hamartia, which is uh, thought to be the main word used for sin in the Bible, but semantically the word has this meaning, to do amiss or to lose the goal. To do amiss or to lose the goal. Okay, so that's what that word means. Um, so that's usually when you, when, you, when you sin, you do a miss or you miss the goal. Uh, and see, now if you try to apply that everywhere the Bible talks about sin, uh, you're going to miss some stuff. You're going to come up with crazy stuff. Okay, you, you missed the mark. You missed the goal. You didn't quite measure up. Well, all people, um, all humanity 
never measured up. Okay? They missed the goal of righteousness. They didn't get there. No one can do it in their own power or their own ability because of, because of uh, they live in sin. The second word um, is agnoima. Agnoima. Okay? And it means a mistake. Con contained in the word for mistake, agomania, and I'll probably just mutilate these words, but just stay with me here, okay? Contained in this word is the idea of a lack of knowledge or an, an element of ignorance, okay? You go to work, open up the refrigerator, and there's a bunch of drinks. They say, that's employer's fridge, and, and you're just not real bright about things. And you go and get a drink out of there. You really stole it, but somebody said, that's the employer's fridge, and you mistook it, meaning it was available to the employees to get a drink out of there, okay? You were ignorant. You, you, I was wrong. You made a mistake, but the ignorance of it is why you did it, okay? Okay, so we had, these are the two lesser words for sin, okay? People make mistakes. People do make mistakes. They make, make a choice, they make a mistake based on ignorance or lack of knowledge about something. Um, they miss the mark, they come up short, you know, they didn't make, quite make it. Uh, those are the two, the, the two uh, lower ends of the words for sin. Uh, the next word is, is a word, um, para, parabasis, parabasis, and... Um, and then the fourth, the fourth one, which is iniquity, is uh, uh, anomia, anomia, okay? Um, now, parabasis means this, transgression. Now, what's that? You know what you're doing. Par you transgress a known law, and it really contains the idea of passing the limit of the law. Now, how many have parabasis when you're driving? Come on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? What's the limit? 35, 45, 55, 65, 70. That's the limit. And how many pass that limit on occasion? Okay. You are in parabasis. You know the law. You know the limit. And you push it. Now, some of you push it more than others. I'm a seven-mile kind of limit parabasis guy. Well, I transgress about five to seven miles over because I usually don't mess with you. Why? Because they're looking for a bigger fish. Now, you come busting by there at, at 85 and a 65, and you're going to have Henry on your back end. Hello. Are you here? You understand what I'm saying? I'm, I mean, Barney, excuse me, Barney will be back there with his one bullet chasing you down the road. All right? Why? Because you do the limit. Well, you can't play ignorance of the law. Why? Because there's a sign there that says speed limit. And when you go past that, when you push the limit of that and go past that, you have transgressed that law. Amen? So when the Bible says, thou shalt not steal, and you steal, you've transgressed. You haven't had just a come up short and, or, or you know, meant to do a miss or to come up short, or you haven't had a mistake when you walk into the store and you grab your zero bar and you walk out with your zero bar and they catch you on the way out the door, you transgress because you know you're not supposed to steal. Now, when your two-year-old is at the counter and you're busy paying and they're busy ringing up and you get out to the car and they got pockets full of candy, they're in agonima. Ag 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 they have made a mistake. And you usually march them back in there, make them give it back, make them apologize. If, you know, you get to give them a lesson that you don't take this because it wasn't paid for. So first time was a mistake. But then you tell them it's wrong. And from then on, if they come back out, and they get, <laughs> uh, they, they get their back in wore out. Why? Because they transgressed. They knew they weren't supposed to, and they pushed the limit of that law. So we have sin, you know, to, 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 uh, to miss. To, to, um, to miss, and I'm trying to get these words all straightened out for you because there, there's so many of them. So, um, and I'm not a Greek pronunciator. Hamarit, hamartia, meaning to uh, do a miss or to lose the goal. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't hit it right. You knew you, did, you just came up short. You know, you only kept 2,999 of the laws. You missed one, so you're guilty of the whole thing. You sinned. You came up short. Okay? Okay. Um, Ag no ima, you made a mistake. You took it, you didn't really know it was wrong. Then you were informed it was wrong. 
with the rod of correction, usually by parents, okay? But then you get to parabasis, meaning you have, you violated, you transgressed a known law, and you push the limits of that law, okay? Now, anonima, anonima, anonia, which is iniquity, when it's referring to transgression, it means the same thing. But it goes further in other contexts, okay? Um, Anomia stands for the more extreme form of sin than that which any of these other words represent. Hamartia and agnoema. Let me see here. If I can come up with a bay. Um, mistake and missing it, all right? Contain the element of ignorance, which is a special characteristic of the latter, agnoema. But the opposite is true of parabasis and anomia. Now, let me, let me spell, let me, let me, can I spell these you write them down? All right. H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A. That is hamartia. And then agnoema, A-G-N-O-E-M-A. All right, so the first one meant to, uh, miss the goal, to do a miss, to lose the goal. The second one meant the mistake, which included the idea of ignorance. The third one is parabasis, P-A-R-A-B-A-S-I-S. -S. And the fourth is anomia, A-N-O-M-I-A. Okay, which is iniquity. That is iniquity, so that's transgression and then iniquity. Um, Hamartia and agnoema can contain the ag element of ignorance, which is a special characteristic of agnoema. But the opposite of true is of parabasis and anomia. It says that sin was in the world before the law came, but it was not sin, hamartia, like the transgression of Adam. Adam did not just come up short. He did not just miss the mark. He transgressed the known law of God. God told him, thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he did it anyway. He went and ate. He transgressed. He did not just simply come up, make a mistake. See, a lot of times when we start teaching on sin or things like that, people are trying to make it, water it down so much. They just think it means to miss the mark. And they water it down so much that there's no real well, what's wrong with it? They missed the mark, you know, and God loves you and you're under grace and so it's all forgiven. Now, see, we, we kind of we play that game. There's, there's a lot of semantic games going on in the church today to water everything down. Why? Because, they're try because Satan is trying to get the church to the state of anomia, lawlessness, which is the strongest word, into the place of iniquity. Now, let me say this. People outside the church, you're going to either expect or anticipate them living lawlessly. Why? Ye are of your father the devil, and the devil, lust of your father you will fulfill. John 8, 44. Satan is their spiritual father. He, he guides them. Their spirits are not alive unto God. You expect them to be lawless. That went over big. Which is why it's important to have natural laws. Natural laws are to govern the lawless spirits. Can I get a choir somewhere? Hallelujah. We have, well, why do we have natural laws? Because we have to govern spirits that are lawless. Amen. Amen. As the as believers that come in, now here's the real problem that I'm having a real, I, I'm, I and a lot of other people have an issue with in the church. The church is trying to act like it's got, it's trying to allow iniquity into the church to make everybody happy. Do not think that the new mantra on homosexuality is all about equality and acceptance. It is about destroying God's moral law. Already in, in other nations that have passed homosexual marriage, they are now are no longer allowed to preach from Romans chapter 1 and read it because it's hate speech. And they're already starting here. Don't think the homosexual bunch is not coming after the church. Because they, why? Well, they're, they, they don't want to get married in church because they want a godly marriage. They want to shut down the ability of the church to be righteous and to have a voice of righteousness. And men and women live righteously. They want to shut the voice of that and abandon the laws of God and become lawless. And let me say something. 
homosexual marriage would have never got through the Supreme Court of the United States of America if the churches of America hadn't embraced it ahead of time. Amen. That went over big. It's still the truth. Okay? Um, what characterized the transgression of Adam was the breach of a known law. Adam broke the covenant deliberately. There must be something to transgress before one can have a transgression. All right? All human sin has an element of transgression in it. But just as it has an element of ignorance, on the, um, uh, on the other hand, man does not have full insight into the evil of sin. Neither can he know the full impact of the results of sin. But on the other hand, everyone who does not know the law has the acts of the law written in his heart. In any case, with the law came the possibility for the first time to transgress. Now, remember, the Bible says that sin reigned from um, Adam to um, I mean, from Adam to Moses, remember that? But see, without the law. And so, okay? Hallelujah. Therefore, parabasis, that's transgression, and anomia, lawlessness, are sin in a more def a definite form than hamartia, ha hamartia, that's a sin or a fault, and agnoema, which is a mistake. A clear distinction between, be between anomia and parabasis. Because lawlessness and transgression... Um, transgression and violation of law are, are one and the same thing. If you violate the law, you transgress the law, it's the same thing. But anomia is not only a violation of the law, it is lawlessness. It's, it's, it's Dodge City on a Saturday night back in the late 1800s. Okay? When anomia is considered to be merely a violation of the law, then it is identical with parabasis. But when anomia refers to lawlessness, its meaning differs from parabasis. There is a difference between violation of the law and lawlessness. What is lawlessness? There ain't nothing. There's no constraints. Do whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter. There's no consequences for it. You might have a shootout in the street, but there, there's no law there. I mean, it's kind of like, like I said, Dodge City, and the sheriff tries to ride into town and establish law, they just shoot him and kill him and go on about the business. Okay? Because he represents law, and they're lawless. Okay? Violation of the law means to break the law, but listen to this, but lawlessness means to abolish the law. What do you think just happened when the Supreme Court said everybody could marry? We just abolished the rules concerning marriage. We, we, we abolished God's moral law about a man and a woman being joined together in holy matrimony. We abolished it. Now, now, there's already the next day or, or, or within a week, somebody filed a lawsuit because they want to have multiple wives. And, a concern, and, and under the 14th Amendment, if you're going to apply the 14th Amendment as equal protection for everybody and apply it to homosexual marriage, you're going to have to apply it to polygamy. And you're going to have to apply it to pedophilia. Oh, we don't want that. Oh, give me a stinking break. Yes, they do. That I don't care what they say. That's just their mantra to, to shove it down everybody's throat. They're, it's, they've already got psychological studies coming out. They no longer call the pedophile a pedophile. They call them a minor attracted adult. Wow. In, in college studies. And doing studies that say that children who, who were involved as, as the, um, the victim of pedophilia are not harmed by the events. These are psychological studies coming out of big universities. Why? So that in five years or wherever, we had the rate things are going faster than that, they can come in and say that 12-year-olds who want to be engaged in sexual relations with an adult man can be and that he can marry him because under the 14th Amendment, there's equal protection and they cannot deny anybody what they want to do because they love them. The woman who was just sentenced in Florida to 22 years for having relations with her 17-year-old high school male student said she loves him. I can guarantee you her court case is going to go to court under the guise that she's under the 14th Amendment and she loved him and she had a right to have those relations with him. It's, it's happening. What is this? Lawlessness. The law, I mean, one of the, one of the justices in his dissent about the Supreme Court ruling said, do, do words not mean anything anymore? The law says certain things, but it no longer means anything. And that's what happens when you have iniquity. Lawlessness takes place. Nothing means anything anymore. We had some bozo senator just get up the other day and say that the Second Amendment did not refer to individual rights, individual gun ownership. 
Because she's stupid. No, she is a communist Marxist socialist who wants to help take guns away from everybody in America. Although the, the Constitution says it, they want to rewrite it, get a court case in there, get the whacked out Supreme Court to rule, and overturn the, 12, the Second Amendment as meaning everybody has the right to bear arms. What are, you in, what are, we, what are we heading toward? We are heading to because the church, everybody say the church. The church has become full of iniquity. And we got to stop. The church has to wake up. Okay? Violation of the law means to break the law. But lawlessness means to abolish the law. To act as if the law did not exist. We are in the church. And churches are embracing homosexual relationships. There are all kinds of stuff coming in. church, putting homosexuals in leadership. Ordaining homosexual priests. Now, why are you saying, because that's the biggest one that's out there right now. What have we entered into? We have entered into a church of iniquity, a church of lawlessness, acting like the laws of God did not exist. And Jesus hated iniquity. Jesus abhorred lawlessness. Come on now. If I was telling everybody, you're under grace, and it doesn't matter what you do, God's going to bless you anyhow. Woo! Praise the Lord, let's buy some books. I'm going to buy your tape series. I'm going to go pay $70 and go to your conference and have, be told that I don't, there's no consequences to anything I do. This is the church of iniquity. This is what the Bible says. Know ye not that in the last days perilous times shall come. Hello? Let me find that real quick. Isn't it in Timothy? One of the Timothys? Second Timothy chapter 3. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, verse 3, without natural affection. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, Fierce, despisers of those that are good, trady, headers, uh, uh, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. It didn't say, bring them into your church to put them on your leadership team. Right, that's right. That's right. It said, turn away from them. He did not say embrace their sin and tell them that God loves it. Yes, God loves them. We're to preach the truth. And the truth is that if you don't repent and turn to Jesus Christ, there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. You will go to hell. But the state says I can get married. It doesn't matter what the state said. God, the Bible says, he created them male and female, created he them, hallelujah, and for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife. Did not say, go by, uh, go by Ben and Jerry's hubby hubby instead of chubby hubby. In case you didn't know that, they, bought, they changed one of their ice creams a few years ago from chubby hubby to hubby hubby in celebration of gay marriage in Vermont. The Bible says that in the last days, para, this is perilous times. I mean, things are happening so fast and so crazy, and people are acting like a bunch of lunatics. Why? Because lawlessness, iniquity is beginning to rule, even in our nation. It's beginning to take over from the top, from the White House, right on down. And it doesn't matter which party, the rhinos or the Democrats, it doesn't matter. Hello? Who are the rhinos? The Republicans. Republican in name only. They're acting like a bunch of socialist commies too. It doesn't matter. We have lawlessness. The, the president of the United States of America said that the church must change its views on homosexuality. We must change our views. I'm sorry. I am sorry. No, I'm not even sorry. I'm flat out ticked off. I will not change my views to appease a man. 
I will not preach unrighteousness and wicked. One translation calls the word here where it says iniquity. Now, now see, now what it says here in Hebrews 1, 9, it says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. It's a quote, I believe, from somewhere in Isaiah. And it says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated wickedness. God, folks, do not buy the love mantra that the love of God means it's okay to do whatever you want to do. God hates, abhors. Is that stronger? When you abhor something, it disgusts you. Sin is disgusting. The Bible says it's a shame to even talk about what people in sin do in the darkness. It's even a shame for us to talk about it. That doesn't sound like it's a pleasant thing to me. It sounds disgusting. It's abhorrent. We abhor it. We should abhor it. Jesus abhorred lawlessness. He abhorred wickedness. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we got people with the word church over their building, and they're embracing lawlessness. Not just homosexuality. They're embracing fornication. They're embracing dope smoking. They're, embra they're embracing getting drunk. They're embracing all kinds of stuff in the church. And, and I'm free to do whatever I want to do. You ain't free to do whatever you want to do. You, study, you, you need to study your Bible just a little bit better and stop listening to skinny jeans people. I think it's cut off the, blood, the flow of blood to their heads. Are you here? Bad head and skinny jeans. Man. Everybody thinks they're cool with their, their television programs. I am telling you, when they do not teach the full counsel of the word of God, they are causing problems in the church. And people listen to people and they're coming out going, I'm under grace. It doesn't matter what I do. I can live any way I want to live. No, you cannot. When you were born again, you were not, you were not delivered to live like you want to live. You were set free from the power of sin to live under the power of righteousness. You are to live godly and in Christ Jesus, hallelujah. You are to be imitators of God as dear children. You are to be holy even as he is holy, glory to God. When you are free from sin, you became a servant, Paul writes, you became a servant to righteousness. Amen. You are, you're not, listen, you are a servant to righteousness. Don't you do this to me. You had 46% this morning. What are you doing? I might need my phone. It's on my desk. Because this is going to die. I, 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 my battery don't hold charge. I, something's on it. Eat draining my battery these days. I've got to figure out what it is. Can't hardly get it charged. And when it does charge, it runs down real quick. When we were free, he that is dead to sin is free from sin. What does it mean? It means from the power of sin. If you're free from the power of sin, now remember this, man is a subservient being. What do I mean by that? You have, you have the right to choice, but you can choose one of two things. Life or death, blessing or cursing, Satan or God. You don't have, there's not a third choice. I did it my way. I mean, you can't go sing Frankie or Elvis' version. It doesn't matter which version you sing. You don't have the right to choose doing it your way. What do I mean by that? You don't get to run off and say, God, I don't want you. Devil, I don't want you. If we're going to do it Ed's way. I can, you are either subservient to God or subservient to the devil, which means you're either subservient to sin, the power of sin, or you're subservient to righteousness, the power of righteousness. Can you say Amen. Amen. So, you have one of those places to live. And so, God said that Jesus loved righteousness, but he abhorred lawlessness, iniquity. The strongest word for sin in the Bible is iniquity, and Jesus hates iniquity. He did not come to shed his blood. He did not come and walk the earth for three and a half years and put up with the persecution and demonstrate the love of God and go to the cross and pour out his blood and be raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of the Father so you could continue to sin. He came to deliver you from the power of sin. He came to set you free, glory to God. Can you say amen? Second Corinthians, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. All things are of God. Verse 21, for he who knew no sin was made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 
We are to call to live a righteous life. We are called to live a life free from the power of sin. Why in the world would anybody want to find that and bring into the church and teach in the church that you can keep sinning and it's okay? We had some stuff taught here a couple of months ago. And I'll be honest with you, some stuff that was said, I just can't, I uh, was so far whacked out, I couldn't even, I couldn't, I didn't even know what to say. They asked him, how, how was that? I couldn't even answer it. Hello. David and Bathsheba were supposed to be together. No, they weren't. You know why David got in there with Bathsheba? Because he didn't do what he was supposed to do. He's supposed to be out fighting. Instead, he's back on the rooftop looking at naked women. Hello? Don't do that stuff when I'm preaching. He had his own private Playboy channel. Hello? He's up there looking at naked women instead of fighting. They weren't ever supposed to be together. How do you know? Because she was married. I said she was already married. She had a husband. She had given herself to a man in marriage, and she was married to another man. And Jesus said, when you look on another woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery already. Well, see, God's always the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. That man and God felt the same way when David did it. And the prophet came. The prophet came not to say, you got out a little ahead of me. Hello? When Nathan showed up and said, began to say to David, there was a man in the city, one had much, one had only, uh, had very little. As a matter of fact, he only had one little lamb. But the man who had wanted to have a party. And so he went and took from the guy who only had one lamb, took that, killed that for himself. And David got mad. Because why? Because it was wrong. He said, as the Lord liveth, as our soul liveth, that man shall surely die. And Nathan looked at him and said, you be the man. And David began to repent. Now the child died that she had conceived. But the prophet did not come and say, hey, look, man, if you just held on a little bit longer, you could have had her anyway. He said, no. See, this is the stuff that's going on in the church. We're watering stuff down. I mean, we've, this is stuff's been going on now. Sexual problems in the church have gotten out of hand. I mean, they shouldn't even be in hand. They should be totally not, non-existent. But they've gotten crazy. About 15 years ago, there was this pastor up a few states north of us. Him, him and, the, uh, and the pianist or organist or music, whatever she was, got, in, got into adultery. It was not an affair. We want to call it an affair because it sounds better. It was adultery. They both filed for divorce from their spouses. And another church in another state further north had already worked out an agreement with them as soon as the divorces came through and they, they were going to bring them up marrying them and put them back in the ministry. No. You're going to come up here and you're going to stand up publicly and, and publicly and say, I was in an adulterous relationship which violates the laws of God. I repent because I was wrong. Not, we're going to get married and talk about how the blessing of the Lord is and put you back in the ministry. You have to repent. David had to repent. There was a price to pay for what he did. Wow. So now the church is getting cute, and we're bringing all kinds of stuff in. We're putting people in sin in positions of leadership. We're telling them it doesn't matter what they do. They're under grace. God loves you. We're, we're just, what's going on? We are instituting iniquity in the church. What they do at the Supreme Court of the United States is one thing. That's the world. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't agree with it. I don't believe in it. I think we as citizens need to do things to fight that as a natural citizen. But in the church, this is why we have the problems. The church is bringing in the spirit of iniquity. Lawlessness. It doesn't matter what you do. We are, we're condoning it. We're, we're embracing it. Hello? So we, we, we end up here with this saying this, that they not only want to abolish the law, act like it never existed before. Listen, J Jesus says in Matthew 7, 23, and then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. 13, 41 of Matthew. These are all Matthew, these next four back Matthew. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that, that offend and them which do iniquity. 
23, 28. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but are full, you are full of hypocrisy within. You are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. 24, 12. And because iniquity... Oh, listen to this. Look at Matthew 24, 11. I'm sorry, we've got to go there. I saw this. Thought, I only copied the 12, but I want to read the, the, the previous verse. This is the church. And church, I am speaking to us as a church. Say, Pastor Ed, if you would just compromise a little bit, we'd get more people. Shut the door and, and, and lock it. I'm leaving. I will not compromise the truth to get people in the building. I can go bankrupt, lose everything I got, and I'll just go back out and cut grass and cook fried chicken somewhere. I will not. <laughs> I will not invite the, the, the man of sin, the spirit of the man of sin. And when the Bible talks about the man of sin, that word is anomi, anoema, the man of iniquity. The Antichrist. And remember the word of God says the spirit of Antichrist is already in the earth. Hello? Matthew, uh, where did I say Matthew 24? Verse 11. Matthew 24. Let's start in verse 4. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Take heed that no man deceive you. All right, church, here's a warning from who? Jesus Christ, the head of the church. Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. They're not saying that they're actually Jesus, but they're of Christ. They're, 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 they represent Jesus. Okay? You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes, and diverse places. Now, how many of you have noticed in the past about five or six years, they've been having earthquakes all over the Midwest, Texas, Oklahoma. We had some here. They're all over the place. Then they shall, uh, and listen to this, and these are the beginning of sorrows. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted. They shall kill you. They shall be, you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And, that, and then many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. I'm telling you, there are people in the church who are becoming offended and hating Christians because they're taking a stand. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound... The love of many shall wax cold. And he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Notice it said here, false prophets will arise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, not in the world, but in the church, the love of many shall wax cold. They're going to get cold toward Christ. They're going to be all about them. They're going to be all about having their way. They're going to be all about having their say. They're all going to be all about governing, controlling the way the church functions and operates in lawlessness because they won't allow, they don't want the word preached. They don't want the things spoken. We've got, we've got the metropolitan community churches in America that go around and, re, and, and reinterpret Greek words to mean something that they don't mean so they can live in homosexuality and lesbianism and all that kind of junk. You know, they're all, what, the, what are the iniquity is abounding where? Not just in the world. Because I'm telling you, if my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves and seek my face, amen? Pray and seek my face. I will hear from heaven. I will heal their land. The church is too busy becoming full of iniquity to do what Jesus said over in Second Chron well, Jesus, the, the, the God said over in Second Chronicles, and pray for the healing of their land. And iniquity is about, and the church is waxing cold in its love for God. And we're going to have to have revival in the church. There's going to have to be a reviving. You know what? I'm going to tell you something. That's all right. You know, all this pressure is coming on the church. See, the devil's stupid. He apparently can't read history. Just like a lot of Americans can't read history. All the junk going on. All the, did you know they just dug, they, they, they voted in Memphis to dig up some Confederate general and take him off public land because he was a racist? Him, his family, his wife, his children, everybody dug up and going to be moved because they say he was a racist because he was a Confederate general. He had slaves. So did Lincoln. We're going to dig up Lincoln's grave? 
And Washington? We're going to dig up Washington? Who else are we going to dig up? Well, what's happening? We're rewriting history right now. We are rewriting. We're having revisionist history. It's going on and it's going on at, the rate, uh, at a rate we can't even keep up with. But that's okay. And the persecution is coming against the church. It's all right. Because what happens when the persecution comes? The church suddenly wakes up and gets strengthened. And the more they try to scatter us, the more... It's like going up and trying to... Uh, in the midst of a real dry area and there's a fire starting, and you try to go beat it out, you spread the embers. And one little ember goes over here and catches on fire over here. And another goes over fire and catches on fire over there. And these little embers, they were all together in one spot. You tried to put it out. What you all you did was spread it and it flamed up and caught. And revival comes. Revival's coming. Outpouring of the power of God's coming. Now, now, Daddy Seaborn said about 100 years after the end of Azusa Street, and Azusa Street took place in the early 1900s, he said there'd be another Azusa Street type revival. I'm telling you, it's a coming on the earth. The persecution's coming. The enemy's working hard. The enemy knows his time is short. He's coming after the church, but he's coming after the church. I'm telling you that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. I am telling you that when Satan begins to persecute the church, the head of the church shows up, glory to God. And the head of the church raises people up, glory to God. And all these little Mickey Mouse, Millie Mouth, people who are just collecting on the gospel, living in their little worlds of compromise, are going to face the head of the church. And either they're going to change or get, or get back on the track with God. But I am telling you, God is raising up men and women who will not compromise, who will preach the truth in the midst of adverse circumstances and situations, and in the midst of a lawless church, they're standing up and saying, I love righteousness, and I abhor iniquity, and I'll obey God and preach the truth, and the power of God's falling on the church that will not compromise, praise God, and Jesus will have his say Amen. in the earth. And men will turn from their sin and turn unto the true and the living God. And all these people who played games coming up to this are going to lose it all if they don't repent. God's cleaning house. Some Texas church just had a mass gay wedding ceremony. Do you think Jesus was happy about that? He hates iniquity. Do you think that the, now remember, he told the churches in Asia Minor, he said, I'll come put your candle out. Yes, he, did. Yes, he, did. he said, you keep doing the uh, working against me, I'm going to come put your candle out. See, they were, they, were lamp, they were lights, they were lamps. You don't mess with the head of the church. And go do things in his name that, abhor, that he abhors. And expect to keep getting, I'm going to get blessed no matter what I do. <laughs> Your candle will get put out. You keep messing around, he'll spew you out of his mouth. Hello? But God loves everybody. He loves righteousness. He loves people and sent Jesus to provide righteousness. But when you mock him, when you work against him, when in his name you come and you're a false prophet and deceive many, he said it's better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the sea than to offend one of these. What's he mean by offend? To damn their souls to hell. By your false prophet, prophetic teaching and your false doctrines. He said, you'd be, you'd be better off somebody just tired to, to, to pull a, a Jimmy Hoffa on you. Just disappear into the ocean. You know, have the mafia show up and tie concrete around your feet and just dump you in there. It'd be better off for you than to mess with, mess with and cause people to go to hell. Hello. I am telling you, the church is at a critical state. And God is dividing the sheep from the wolves. We are looking at to the church right now, and we're seeing a... Randy Greer preached this back in about 2007, 2008, 2009. Then in 20, uh, 2010, 2011, there was coming a separation in the church, and boy, did it take place. And is it ever taking place today? I know, quote, and I say this with, with every, bit of, every dripping ounce of sarcasm I can say, pastors who took their profile pictures and put the gay flag over it in celebration of the Supreme Court ruling. Yeah. 
power, you're going to have to face the head of the church. And I'm going to tell you something. Dad Hagen talked about, he said, the Lord's eyes, he, got, he said he was having a discussion with the Lord in, in a vision one time, and he said the Lord got angry with him because he kept arguing with him. He said his eyes became like fire. Now the eyes of the Lord are full of compassion, but I can tell you, when judgment begins to come, they're full of fire. I remember the battle hymn of the Republic. Pretty good song, isn't it? Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. I'm telling you, there's a wrath coming. And it's going to begin in the house of God first. Woe be to you pastors who are teaching lawlessness from your pulpits. I said, woe be to you. And you better repent while you got time to repent. Because I am telling you, a judgment is coming on the church. And there will be a separation. And there will be a calling out to holiness and righteousness of those who will not compromise the things of God. Who will say, no, I love righteousness and I abhor iniquity. I'm going to follow after the Lord. We're going to teach the truth. And we're going to say what the Bible says. I don't care. They're going to lock you up. You're going to say what the Bible says. They want your guns registered so they can take them. Don't, don't think they don't. They want, your, they, they want to make ammunition so expensive you can't buy it because they want to take your guns. One Nazi, one woman from Nazi Germany who's, who's still alive said, don't give your, up your guns, go buy more. Because she was there when it happened. Once they got the guns, they took over the nation. Remember, what was Obama's book? Something about his father? Huh? Dreams of his father. You know what my, Hitler's book was? Mein Kampf? My, my Kampf. My father. Huh? My struggle. But when did he have something his father? He had something on his father. Second He had a book on his father. He had a book on his father. We've got stuff. They want, they, the Germany took the guns. They're trying to take our guns. And why is this happening? Because the church has allowed the spirit of the man of iniquity to infiltrate it and to take over. We've got churches that are, vo- you shouldn't even be voting whether or not you're going to allow homosexual marriage. As a matter of fact, anybody that brings it up should be excommunicated on the spot. I think we should vote whether we have homosexual marriage. You are excommunicated from this church. You repent in sackcloth and ashes. And if you repent and we judge your repentance as true, we might let you back in. Otherwise, out. You don't bring that garbage in here. Well, we're going to have a big conference about it. Conference about the Bible? We're going to have a conference as to whether or not you, you must be born again. What? Jesus said you had to be. Who are you conferencing with? The head of the church said you had to be. The spirit of Antichrist (laughs) is infiltrating the church through godless, and I mean godless, infiltrations by the enemy into the pulpits, into the hierarchy, they don't know Jesus. And they're taking over whole denominations. Do you know what happened in America when the Episcopal Church decided to ordain the gay priest up in wherever he was from? Now, he'd been living in sin all those years with his sodomite lover. And instead of excommunicating him, they changed the rules and allowed him to be, stay in the ministry. Churches all over America left the Episcopal Church and joined the African Communion. What do you mean? See, in, in liturgical terms, you know, you have the Anglican Church out of England. It's the, Ang- it's, it's, the Eng- it's the Anglican Communion out of England. The American Church was part of the English Anglican Communion. The African Communion rejected wholeheartedly without any discussion on it, homosexuality. And so ch- Episcopal Churches became... African Communion Episcopal churches or Anglican churches and rejected the American church's authority. So the diocese in America no longer had authority. They said, no, we're not doing that. We're not having any part of this. We're joining the African Communion because they know what's right. But all the liberal 
churches that were infiltrated with the godlessness, the, that, that spirit of Antichrist, stayed with it and embraced it. You got United Methodist churches embracing homosexuality. I know the one of the Wesley brothers looked over at the other Wesley brother and said, What were you thinking? You didn't put that into the bylaws? I mean, I, I bet the Wesley brothers have rolled over three or four times. Hello? I mean, they might, their, their vault might be opened. They might be up on top of their vault preaching, You are going to hell if you don't repent. I think it was Charles when, when they kicked him out of his father's church because they didn't like what he was preaching uh, back in England. When he went back to England, he got out there on his daddy's tombstone and finished his sermon. <laughs> out of the church graveyard. He went there and finished his sermon because they booted him out because they didn't like what he was preaching. <laughs> hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to wrap up right here. I am not saddened and I am not in despair. Because there are the Charles Wesleys, and there are the Martin Luthers, and there are the men and women of faith. There are the Apostle Pauls, and there are the Peters who will not compromise their faith, but will take their stand in this hour and speak the truth only, glory to God. They'll speak it in love, but they'll speak the truth only, praise God. I am not in despair because the head of the church, Lord Jesus Christ, I'm telling you there's a great revival coming on the earth, praise God. And those who are walk, walking with God and moving with the cloud, moving with the cloud, moving with the cloud, glory to God, are going to walk in the glory and walk in the power and see many he turned to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Masses will come to the kingdom of God because men and women, I know there are men and women all over the place. Just like when the prophet went in despair and said, I'm the only one left. God said, I have raised up 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to Baal. Hallelujah. You're not alone. We are not alone. There are men and women all over the place who've not bowed their knee to the spirit of iniquity who will take their stand in this hour. And revival is coming on this nation, praise God. And revival is coming on the earth. And Jesus Jesus is going to have his way in the earth. I'm not in despair. Hallelujah. There are things that will take place. There are things that must take place. But one of those things that must take place is the rise of the glorious church. Hallelujah. The blood-bought church, praise God, that will take her stand in the, uh, the last days. And the greatest hour of the church shall be the last hour. Glory to God. Yes, lawlessness is in here. We got, we got to preach about that. We got to talk about that. We got to share that. We got to say it's out there. But despair not. I said, be not in despair. Hallelujah. God is not surprised. As a matter of fact, he told us it was going to happen. I said, he told us it was going to happen. Not so we could kick back and go, whoa, praise God, let's just join them. See, so there are people who preach because they, they, they like the power or they like the money or they like, like people liking them. He said, Peach Boy, hate you for my name. Oh, man, I am really with the Lord. <laughs> Hello? People get, people get mad at me and hate me and they don't even know why. You'll say, what did I do? I don't know. I'm just mad at you. What about? I don't know. Does that, doesn't that, isn't that a clue? Hello? You get ticked off at me and hate me because what? I don't know. Or I forgot. Wow, that was impressive. That was an impression on you, wasn't it? How many know what somebody did to you in third grade and you're still mad at them? It had to be Jesse or Shannon, Nathan, because you're in third grade. You were homeschooled. It was Shannon, Okay. No, Shannon's not here to defend herself, so we picked Shannon. No, it probably was Shannon. Anyway, be not, do not be in despair. Do not fear. We are the church. We will not compromise, but we will walk in the power and the glory. Hallelujah. We'll stand our ground in faith, praise God. We'll declare the righteousness of God in the earth. We will not bow down and, and, to, and to pressure from the wimpy, weenie-fied church leaders who want us to say everything's about live. Because the love of God constrains me to preach the truth and call your repentance and call you out from among them to be separate and to be holy. As lights in the earth. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. Hallelujah. Can you say glory? glory. I said, can you say Shonda? Hallelujah. All right.
Father, we thank you for this time. Oh, I'm, I'm telling you, I just, there's a... There's a there, there's a disorder that keep a fatty in the matabat school. There is a, a what's, what's where? I, well, Lord, I didn't want to say it that way. There's a prophetic unction about us right now. We must speak the oracles of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. They hated John the Baptist. For, now let me say. The religious people hated John the Baptist. The hurting, the bound, the afflicted came out into the desert to hear him. And then Jesus came. They, they, the religious leaders were trying to kill him from the get-go. And they ended, and ended up, the religious leaders are the ones who had him put to death. But the hurting and the diseased and the afflicted would go so far out they were too far away to go get food. To hear him preach. Hello. The world is not looking for the compromising church. The world is not looking for the cool church. The world's not looking for the church that wants to tell you you can drink wine, you can smoke your stogie, you can have your rum. The world's not looking for the church that tells you we don't disciple you. You know, the world's not looking for the church that says, you know, come and be, hang out and be cool and, you know, and be religious all at the same time. They're just a bunch of frogs in water that you're boiling. What they're looking for is a church that brings a word of truth that liberates and sets them free from the authority and the power of sin. So they can live as God designed them. Men and women who've been joined to the Lord as one spirit. Glory to God. We will be part of that church. We are part of that church. We will never be part of the compromising church. As I said, I'll shut the doors. I'll sell off everything. I'll declare, but I'll do everything. I will never compromise the church so we can continue to exist. I can sell everything I got and go live in a tent. Wouldn't like it a lot, but I could go do it. I can pull my camper from the beach and put it on some, out there in some woods somewhere. I hope somebody don't catch me. I'm telling you, we will not compromise the truth and live under the authority of the man of iniquity, his spirit that's in the earth already. We will live under the authority of the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will live under his authority and power and preach the truth. Because we love righteousness, Jeff. And we hate iniquity, Benny. And because of that, we're going to be anointed with the oil of gladness above our fellows. Amen. You feel a hate speech, no? I'll say, this, boy, God showed me this recently, and it kind of came out this way. And I am telling you, it is the truth. The person who condones your sinful lifestyle hates you. The person who emboldens you into lawlessness, hates you. Because they are damning your soul to hell. The man or the woman who stands up and says, that is wrong, that is error, that will take you to hell. It's not hate. They love you because they're willing to tell you the truth to avert, to, to, in, in an attempt to avert your ultimate destiny if you don't repent. They're the true lovers. They really are the ones that love you because they're willing to tell you the truth. The other ones don't love you. They hate you. They're willing to let you go to hell just so they can have a good image with people. Hello? I said they're willing to let you go to hell just so everybody likes them. That don't sound like love to me. <coughs> Father, we thank you for our service. We bless the people. We speak life over them in Jesus' name. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at 
www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.